Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Thank you, Tom and Tim, for inviting me here. I think the, okay, w w what can I say? This project is fantastic on the macroeconomic uh, monetary and fiscal history of Latin America. Uh, well, talking about uh, comfort zones, as you can imagine, I'm very uncomfortable presenting this very good paper by Felipe, but uh, of course, by understandable, very sad reasons, uh, Felipe couldn't be here. So uh, <coughs> the paper is three stages of Mexico's monetary and fiscal history, growth with low inflation, fiscal expansion, and reforms. As uh, Felipe said to me, this is a very first preliminary draft because of the reasons we, we just mentioned. And uh, the core of the paper is uh, to analyze the, the history of Mexico through the lenses of Sargent, uh, Carrigan, and Wallace, and the paper by, I would say, Nicolini, uh, Quijo, and Sargent. Um, at the core of the paper, uh, because it is an incomplete paper, uh, we have um, the authors describe um, the accounting of the budget constraints. No? I mean, uh, they, they, they follow the model expressing Quijo, Nicolini, Sargent. And then they will, <coughs> they will uh, uh, concentrate on the, the budget constraint obtained in uh, 1A. Uh, and in, uh, they will be very um, concentrated in analyzing the evolution of the different type of debts and on the budget constraint and how uh, the, the evolution of the, of the debt uh, could finance uh, basically the interest rate payments uh, plus the deficit. So they will, uh, I guess that the paper is very much uh, biased towards the analysis of the evolution of, of debt. And uh, the authors will analyze two types of crises. I mean, it says three stages of, uh, of growth of the Mexican economy, but they will focus on two crises, the 1982-83 crisis, and then the tequila crisis, okay? So, um, <clears throat> well, these are, are basically the objects that are on, on the budget constraint. Uh, what is interesting is that they, they calculate the theta n, but they couldn't uh, recover uh, the indexed national debt. Okay, you remember, and so they, they will plug uh, all the, the indexed debt uh, into the, what's called the national public debt. And what is, <coughs> they make some definitions. The government uh, will be defined as the, what is called the public sector, plus two, two entities, one is called the institute and firms under direct budget control, AFDSC, and the other is the uh, institutions and firms under indirect budget control. And the deficit for them will be the primary deficit of the public sector plus the non-financial uh, deficit of this, uh, the first, the second institution, plus the financial intermediation deficit they include of the development banks, so they include the deficit of the development banks, Plus, as they were charged by the paper of uh, Quijo, Nicolini, and Sargent, the transfers. Okay? So, so there is a, a, a very important description on the, in the paper uh, about uh, how they gather the data. Uh, in some sense, they, for, to, to compute the foreign debt ratio, they are having some, some problems with the data because they have data at par value. But what they do is they do a very nice uh, exercise by computing the 1988 debt stock estimated at $64 billion, which is, uh, which is <coughs> and then, uh, which is composed by the bank debt at market values plus the non-bank debt at face value. So they estimate at least part, part of that, I mean, uh, the bank debt at market values, and then uh, the residual will be the non-bank debt at face value. And then <coughs> they, they run a perpetual inventory approach in the sense that they calculate the yearly stocks using the flows to assets and li liability from the capital account. So they can get this uh, theta, theta star. Uh, they don't, they don't uh, they're, they're not going to show the evolution of the real exchange rate, which is one of my comments. I will try to blend the comments and the, the presentation, which I think is, a, is very important. So we talked about, unfortunately, they said, there is implicitly you know, uh, indexed, uh, the indexed national debt, but they couldn't really disentangle from the consolidated figures. So this is the first, uh, <coughs> the first uh, um, graphical analysis. All is on, in, on time series. There is no tables in the, in the paper, so we'll have to cope with this. This is the, 
the theta, the evolution of the, of the foreign debt. So we have a little bit the same, uh, uh, the same pattern than for, for some of the previous countries. So you have, we have here the, the crash of 1982-83. I think this increase in the, in the share is due to the, to the exchange, real exchange rate phenomenon. Then we have huge amortization, uh, is the black one, yes. Uh, and then uh, we see from uh, 1995 onwards a huge decline as is observed for Chile also on, on the foreign debt. What is interesting also in what they show is that what is going up after 1997 is, is the nominal debt. Eh? I mean, the stock of the nominal debt in terms of, of, of GDP is going up. So in some sense, Mexico is overcoming what some economists call the original sin problem. They are floating long-term debt in, in pesos. And then here we have also the, the deficit. Okay? Here is the primary deficit as, as fractions of GDP. What is very interesting is to see that uh, before the crash of 1982, we have cumulative fiscal deficits. And after that, we have a little bit of like a, a random pattern. But in general, we have surpluses. I mean, and surpluses uh, for, for all, the, all the period. So uh, what Felipe does is uh, that he's going to track now the change in the nominal debt ratios and in the foreign debt ratios and, de and deficit as a fraction of GDP. So here, uh, you could see, well, this is the, the same deficit we had before. And this is the, the delta of theta supra n. And, and, and uh, as you can see, apparently, the, the change in the nominal debt ratio doesn't track very well uh, the fiscal uh, deficit he claims. Here, we have the same uh, picture, but with a change in the foreign debt ratio. And here, you know, the, the co-movement is much, much clearer, I mean, in the sense that uh, this tracks much better uh, the, for, the, for the, the influence of the fiscal deficit in the changes on the foreign debt ratio is much more clear. Um, then <coughs> he, he analyzed the other components, like the, the change in the monetary base, which is in, the, in, the <coughs> which is in the, that, that line. So you see there is no movement after 1993-94, a little bit here during the tequila crisis. Uh, and here we have the inflation tax revenue, which skyrocketed a little bit during the after the 1982 uh, crisis. And one the, of the puzzles is what happens uh, during the, the, tequila, the tequila crisis, why we, don't, we do not observe like a, a jump in the inflation senior age. So he, <coughs> and, and then the other important issue is uh, he, he will track the changes in the foreign debt ratio and the total net interest payments as a fraction of GDP. And uh, as you can see, I mean, uh, it is, uh, in some sense, the total net interest uh, payments that is pushing, uh, like, changes in the foreign debt ratio. So he, will, he claims in the paper that uh, about the importance of the total net interest uh, payments. Um, so, so basically, in the last graph, total net interest payments is closely related to the increase in the foreign debt ratio. But he needs, this is the deficit we have, he needs another, uh, he goes further because he needs to separate what, what will be the, the payments and total net interest payments to the nominal, the, to the national debt, and then the, the interest payments to the, to the foreign debt. So what, what they are doing is a very nice exercise. They proxy the gross interest rate for the, for the uh, nominal uh, the na national debt, and then uh, so they proxy with the yield on the city, which is a 28 days zero coupon, and then they calculate the, the total net interest payments on the foreign debt as a residual from the total. So what so basically what they what they show is that the, the movement of total net interest payments is fully explained by uh, the total net payments to the foreign debt. So in this, so there is a there is a very, very flat, I would say, uh, <coughs> a movement in the total net interest payments on the national debt. So he said that well, what, what explains, uh, in some sense, the, the, um, the, the movements in the, in the foreign debt it's, uh, is the, the, the interest paid on the foreign, uh, on the foreign debt. Uh, this is simply, he shows and he tried to justify uh, why uh, he has uh, chosen, uh, basically, the CETES as the 
the nominal, uh, I would say, interest rate to, to calculate the, the return on the, on the national debt or the, the payments on the national debt. And then he does a, a very interesting exercise. I think this is a, a one part that I like very much of the paper. He, he analyzes from the uh, equation 1A the cumulative changes in the debt and the driving components eh, by solving uh, iteratively backwards. So he, he will try to, <coughs> to, to analyze uh, what, what happens, you know, uh, how this, uh, the change in this triplet is explained by, 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 the changes, uh, by the changes in the interest rate payments, by the changes in the, in the de deficits, and by, in some sense, the changes in the, the senior edge. Um, so he, he will introduce a sequence of primary deficit or surpluses, a sequence of interest payments, and then, of course, the negative of cumulative changes in the money base, because this reduces borrowing, I mean, reduces the, the need for borrowing, and the negative in cumulative changes in the inflation tax. So uh, what are the results? The results that they, they present, these are, this is the time series for the cumulative changes of nominal foreign and total debt ratios. And uh, we have, uh, basically, here is the cumulative of uh, the total net interest rate uh, paid. So, so what, what they argue that most of the evolution of the, the, the debt, I mean, the, the, the foreign debt or the total debt of Mexico is explained by uh, the, the total net interest rate paid uh, to the foreign debt. So this is one example. What if, if they analyze then what happens with the inflation tax and the senior edge, so there is a, a lot of movement in some sense, until 1987, okay, this is uh, the inflation tax revenue. Uh, there is a little bit, there is uh, also some issue about the deficit. So here we have a positive deficit, and then we have continuous surpluses. So the surpluses explain, uh, after 1992, uh, the surpluses are going to explain the flattening of the evolution of the, the stock of debt. And then before 1986-87, it is uh, mainly the inflation tax revenue uh, that, in some sense, uh, disinflate the evolution of the, the stock of, of debt. So uh, <coughs> they explain, so they, they try to characterize the, the debt crisis of 1982, and, 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 and they want to, to try to fit the, the empirical evidence of the arithmetics of the budget constraints. They want to fit that uh, to the Sergeant Wallace model, seeing wh which one, I mean, if, if the debt crisis of 1982 can be characterized by, <coughs> by the model. Uh, so he said, well, we have a first, the, the first observation is yes, we have a sizable primary deficit before the crash or before uh, the, then the second institutional features that they explain is that the, the Central Bank of Mexico is dominated by, by the government in terms that there is a, a tendency to have a, an adaptative or passive monetary policy, so there is fiscal dominance until then. They said that, uh, well, there is a progressive do, do increase in the level of indebtedness until 1982, and then when there is a debt constraint, you suddenly you jump towards an inflationary scenario. So he said that the stylized fact, I mean, there is not more on, on that, that uh, is passing by after doing the arithmetics, but he said that the deficit, of course, we, and this is my, my comment, need not be inflationary, of course, and we, we discuss in the morning as long as you can finance them by issuing debt. So it's, uh, it's foreign or uh, so, I don't know. Once debt intolerance is present, the unpleasant fiscal arithmetics push you to an inflationary scenario. So what, what uh, the authors said is that the first crisis of 1982 corresponds very well to the Sargent and Wallace model. I mean, you have all the stylized facts I mean, in, uh, by which uh, after the crisis you jump, I mean, where you don't have <coughs> any more your, your debt constraint, you, the only means you have to finance uh, your deficit is through by printing uh, basically uh, uh, money. So, well, this is the, 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 we, so, so this is the same that we, we, we did. So he presented that. He presented now the total debt as a fraction of GDP, uh, the inflation tax as a fraction of GDP. So after 1980, 81, so there is a spike uh, here, which is uh, what uh, Tom Sargent will, I mean, in some sense, is under the model of, of Tom's, and, and then you have a disinflation after, the, after there is a restructuring of the, of the debt. And what is interesting that the, 
the inflation tax revenue will be very low after 1990s where uh, Mexico has had a lot of uh, structural reforms. Maybe some Mexican here can uh, a little bit discuss uh, more of this. This is the inflation rate measured with the GDP deflator in percent. And so then they discuss, <coughs> and for them what is more puzzling are the economic reforms in the 1990s and the 1994 crisis. So they, they said and, uh, I, uh, that in 1990s the there was a law by which they sanctioned the independence of the Banco de Mexico, and that the goal, the Article 1, the goal was to maintain the purchasing power of the peso. So there was that, like the, the external value of the currency was like the, the overriding goal of the Central Bank of Mexico. And the article said that there will be limits in advances to the government. They wanted to, so, so they, they asked themselves, and I asked also if, if one can say here that we have a change in microeconomic regime, in the sense that you, you uh, uh, that was in 1990s. And uh, however, even if this was implemented in 1993, the independence of the Bank of Mexico, which is very, makes the laboratory very interesting, there, is a, there was a huge internal political shock in March 94. Colosio was assassinated, was, was, and then we started a, a process of political uncertainty. Uh, with this political uncertainty, uh, uh, apparently, well, the time series show uh, the, the, that the issues of Teso Bonos, I mean, the, uh, in some sense, the dollar denominated uh, bonds, short-term short bonds, but payable in pesos, I mean, there was apparently a, a run, I mean, a run or a, re a reduction on the demand for, for long-term Mexican assets, so they started to issue the Teso Bonos. And there was a sizable capital outflows by November, December 94. So when this happened, and uh, so let, let, let me go uh, to the, so this is, this is what they, well, this is a very, very well known, uh, uh, very well known, this is uh, the CETES. Here you have, well, those are the international reserves. So as you can see, there is some sense, the, those are the tesobonos who start you know, uh, increasing until, until uh, the top of the crisis, and then those are repaid. Those are those, the, the TESO bonos, as uh, 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 we were saying, that <coughs> uh, they try to substitute for short-term borrowing with maturity shortening. So the, the, what happens is that the ratio of dollar index debt to international reserves increased. Uh, but even in the early 1995, Mexico could not roll over the short-term debt, which is, is the moment, uh, let's say, uh, of the crisis. So they asked themselves of how the facts fit, the, uh, fit with the model. I mean, how the facts that, uh, because uh, they, they, they said that, well, some silent fact is that Mexico, as we saw, were, were, was not running public deficits, okay? Mexico was not running a primary deficit. I mean, uh, and, and in some sense, they, they, they make the analogy that, that the, the fundamentals of the economy were good. So like the fundamentals of the economy were reasonably good. There was this political uncertainty. The debt ratios were, n were not very high by, uh, in some sense, by historical standards. However, and this is the, the issue they claim, you have this uh, stock of TESO bonos, which net of international reserves skyrocket to $30 billion. So you have this very short-term uh, 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 debt. And then the interest rate also uh, 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 skyrocket. I think we have a, 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 a graph afterwards. Uh, because it, because at, at this point, when, when the, the central bank was losing international reserve, there was this attack uh, to Mexican, uh, to long-term Mexican assets, and there was a shortening of the maturity. They said that maybe the, the interest rate skyrocketed because there was expectation of to have a, a further devaluation. There was a first change in the exchange rate regime with a small devaluation. In general, when you devalue, you solve the, you know, some, some, some of the models said, or like Krugman, or, that you solve exactly, you adjust and you solve the, the situation. But here, it looked that you have the value, you have changed exchange rate regime, and then after this, this change, you had, in some sense, uh, uh, that the, the, the crisis unfolded. So, um, 
So the question is, maybe the, the agents believed that this was, was going to become unsustainable, like the central bank was, uh, as, as, as he said, we have an independent central bank, so we have this issue that we have a, a model with monetary dominance. We don't have any more uh, fiscal dominance, but monetary dominance. Uh, but still there, what are the expectations of the agents? They, they thought that uh, at some point, of course, uh, there will be a default on the, or, or, a, or they were some, in some sense, uh, I think I like Tim is, is using the word gambling because there will be a bailout around the corner. The caveat that the authors and I, I that, that you, well, more on that, because of this political uncertainty, and this policy that was swapping long-term debt for short-term debt, you would expect, unless there is something else going on, you would expect a huge devaluation and the use of seniorage after the, the fact. And the fact is that after the crisis and after the bailout, so they don't explain a little bit how the bailout, uh, in some sense, influenced this. In, in, in the idea my, my comment is that, uh, the, the, the bailout meant that the central bank could maintain its monetary independence, in the sense that there was a, some, an, an external actor, in some sense, uh, giving resources to this economy. Uh, so uh, in, in, in spite of not expanding you know, the quantity of money, and they, they uh, maybe you can correct me, they uh, implemented a pro-cyclical fiscal policy also. Because I, I, was, I was thinking why, why the crisis uh, was resolved in Mexico and, of course, not uh, in, in Argentina in some sense. So there are some political features. Maybe the fundamentals in Mexico were better than in Argentina, but Argentina didn't have, at the moment, a debt, a debt stock over GDP very high by, by historical standards. Uh, so in some sense, what, what, what might explain is that Mexico was, first, geopolitically is important, Second, there was liquidity in international capital markets, which was a curse when they attacked the Mexican asset and a blessing when you had to solve the problem. And the Argentinians were already in a very liquid international capital market. So in, in, in some sense, that, that's, that's why uh, I am, uh, and, and uh, yes, I, 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 in some sense, I agree with the authors that there is a, there is a kind of a, a, a puzzling situation, but uh, maybe the package is what, in some sense, makes the, 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 that, that you, you don't go to an, to an inflation tax, you, you, you return to very low uh, inflation uh, uh, rates. So um, basically here, I think this is a part of the paper. I don't know if you want to go to, I, I, I want just to show one historical, one historical example, because this is the, I, w I was very blessed uh, in 1988, long time ago, because Tom wrote in 1986, Rational Expectation on Inflation. I did my dissertation in Chicago called the Monetary and Fiscal History of Argentina, 1980s, uh, 1920. So this is the evolution of the, of the debt of Argentina. And here you have external debt, and here you have the stopping when you have the famous barring crash. Now this, well, this is a Mexican one. Uh, eh? This, this was the external, the, the, the black line is the evolution of the external, uh, the external debt, you see? So here there is a huge increase in the external debt, which was a little bit what was going on to Mexico. This resembles a lot the 1982 Mexican crisis. And here you have the stopping when you, you, you enter into default, basically. So uh, here what, what is interesting, what, what we did at the moment, or I did at the moment, is, uh, well, we have that the, prim the primary deficits are just cumulative before the crash. So we have primary deficits too. We have this is the inflation rate. And then we, we did a counterfactual inflation rate by, by constructing a time series for the, uh, the increase in domestic credit. And then we calculated the, the counterfactual inflation rate. And of course, the inflation rate would have been by using the, the, the if, if they would have used the means, uh, let's say, the, issues of quantity of money, the inflation rate will be uh, much uh, higher. So this is the primary deficit. And, and, and here you see how this was the skyrocketing, you know, the evaluation. I mean, Argentina was pegging the peso to the gold, to the gold dollar. So you had the, the change in the, the exchange rate regime. So this corresponds, uh, uh, corresponds very well to the, 
<coughs> to the to Tom's uh, uh, model then, and here is what we, we wrote at the moment. You know, the, the, well, the, the, when they had no choice, there was no more instruments. They had to switch from debt finance to money creation to cover an ongoing budget uh, deficit. So the, what is interesting is that the counterfactual accumulative inflation rate is identical to the accumulated real inflation rate. So we show that if you have repressed inflation until, until in some sense you exhaust the capacity to go into debt and you have this unpleasant uh, monetary uh, arithmetic. Yeah. Two questions. What documents? Th this? Yeah. It's my book, Straining at the Anchor. On, on, yes. Yeah, if you, yes. Uh, so, is, you know. so, so what happened? So, in well, it was it was very similar than what uh, the Mexican the Mexican case. What happened is that in nineteen in 1887, they established a law. There was no central bank, so they established a law called the law of national guaranteed banks, which means that you had a plural banks of issue, not not the mo a monopolist, but all of them would peg the paper peso to the gold dollar. Exactly. Like the US, but the problem was that they did, they, they capitalized the bank with an arbitrage operation by taking loans in London. So there was, you know, in some sense, they, they took, they took, uh, they floated bonds in London, so it was not net capital what, what the banks had. The problem, so they, they went into that. We had a, a very, what you call, desarrollista president, a, a, how you say desarrollista, a, 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 a pro growth, uh, you know president who entered into an enormous amount of debt that, that was successfully floated in London. And then when in uh, suddenly, a little bit like in the, the self-fulfilling crisis, uh, the, the public start attack, attacking the, the Argentine assets. Inclu Nobody eh? Nobody no, no, and, and, and exactly. And in 1890, they could not roll over the debt. But not only that, is that the, they start attacking the convertible peso. And so, and so what, what the banks were doing, instead of restricting the quantity of money, because you have an endogenous quantity of money, and they sterilized. And because they start sterilizing, which worsens the, the situation, which means that they, they, lost, they, they lost gold, but they were not contracting the quantity of money when they were losing gold. They were, they were reissuing the money, but without backing, I mean, gold backing. <coughs> So when, so suddenly, so so at the moment, I mean, they, so they they, they, they sterilized, so they they, they 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 maintained the quantity of money, but then when when there was this attack, everything they could not roll over the debt, so they started to to issue currency to to pay the outstanding debt, and they entered the huge depreciation, and default on the, on the debt, and and. How, how the problem was resolved, because the Bank of England, little bit, the Bank of England did, I mean, Argentina was not south of the borders like Mexico, but the, the Bank of England did not want the Baring Brothers to go under, or at least the London market to go under. The Baring Brothers were exposed to Argentina. Oh, there was a million there. Was it, million. Exactly. The, 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 the Bank of England, therefore, arranged with Argentina. Argentina would not default on the federal bonds. They could default on the provincial bonds. I mean, because it was, it, was, it was very unclear whether the provincial bonds had the guarantee of the federal government. So the Bank of England made an agreement called the Funding Agreement, in which a little bit like the package of Mexico, but, but here it was too late, the package. Like we had, the, I mean, the spike in inflation, and then you will see the receding inflation after the package. <laughs> And pay back uh, exactly because they, they said I, w I, I will I will I will bail out the federal bonds I mean but not the provincial bonds okay and then what you had is the, the, the peso was floating but there was after the package was appreciating I mean it was, we saw the world coming back until Argentina went back to the to the gold standard in 1898 99 let me let me just show you because I think we have to go you see no 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 you, you see that here is in the in the in the black line, the, you see the how uh, at the peak you had the beginning of the arrangement with the Bank of England. There is a small problem because 
The, this arrangement was restructured in 18, the arrangement is 1891. The restructuring of the arrangement is 1893. Uh, and then you see all, all this uh, appreciation, I mean, in the sense that paper peso with respect to the gold dollar eh, was, uh, was disinflated. I mean, it was appreciating until they decided not to go, not to go to the par, not to go to the par value, not to disinflate totally to go to the gold standard, but to, to go back to convertibility at the devalued exchange rate. So where would you have found that? Eh? Yes, yes. Oh, this is a so this is your model, you see. I mean, I, I mean at least how I, I interpret it, you know, in, in the sense that uh, suddenly you have, have this. So in the case of Mexico, Mexico maybe had solved here, around here, and then they, they, you have this fixity. The Argentinians, you know, solved much later than the, they were not so lucky than the Mexicans, and, and so they had this, uh, this situation. So, I mean, I, we don't go to the discussion, no, but this issue of the package, how the package influenced. But this is a little bit of a difference because in the next decade, there was no deficit. And here, yes, here. No, no, no. Yeah, yes, yes, it's true. Here it's more like the 1983, you're right. 1983. Here we were running deficits. It's more the sergeant, yes, 1983 story. Yeah. So, so, so when I'm looking at to pay the by balance, the loan, so who pays the the Bank of England, as yes, it was, they, they, did, they did the famous fun, funding loan of 1891. The Bank, the Bank of England, you know, uh, exactly. The Bank of England advanced the money in order for the, the to Argentina in order. To exactly, which and, and you can see that the, the the debt was going still up. Until 1993, the Argentinians said we can not even resist this, the level of indebtedness. And there was a famous uh, agreement called the Acuerdo Romero, which reduced, you know, there the, the was debt relief. Eh? Haircut. It was a haircut. And then with that haircut, and Argentina resumed payments of the provincial bonds, recognized the provincial bonds in 1898. And Argentina was 10 years without fresh money. We, 1898, they resume. Yes. The well, the were the were the provinces uh, floated the bonds in the London market. They were owned by uh, foreign investors. It was a carnival a, a carnival of bonds? Yes. I see. So there was one particular holder that the was trying to protect. Yes, and 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 and, and they, they wanted to pr and they wanted to protect the. Yes, they wanted to protect the too big to fail, the Baring Brothers. I mean, they didn't want the Baring Brothers. Baring Brothers then, they didn't want Baring Brothers to fail immediately because Baring Brothers was uh, overexposed to the to Argentine bonds. They, don't, they, don't, they were not only brokers for the Argentine bonds, but they were market makers. So they had a huge amount of bonds and sold in the in the in the books. <laughs> No, it uh, was, uh, it's not, well, close, yes. It was 70% uh, of the United States. And also, like, as an idea, was it the, 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 the infrastructure of foreign investment from England more than India? So the railroads, I mean, this thing is yes. all. Yes, I don't, I don't have the figure, but Argentina was the uh, 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 first, first receptor of the British issues uh, in between 1880s and 1890s, with a population of 2.5 million inhabitants. So the, the idea not was just to make one city. They made one city out of nothing. They took a lot and said, we make a city. Yeah. I went to college there. Santiago de la Sierra. So that's the oldest city. Okay. <laughs>